The end of the Castro era. Brothers Fidel, then Raul, have led Cuba for six decades, but that is about to change. On this edition of Bigger Than Five, we ask what the handover to a new president could mean for Cuba and its people. We look back on the Castro years and the history of rivalry with the United States. We examine how the Trump presidency is derailing diplomacy. I am canceling the last administration's completely one-sided deal with Cuba. And we hear from Cuban generations old and new about their hopes for Cuba after the Castros. Hello, I'm Rida Fahri in Washington, D.C. Well, as President Trump gets his usual fix of TV news here in the White House this week, it will be hard for him to ignore a bit of history unfolding in Cuba. A new leader is about to be elected there after 60 years of the Castro brothers. First, Fidel, and for the last decade, Raul. They helped to lead a revolution, created a communist state, and defied America and its crippling embargo. As Raul Castro steps aside, we'll ask if it is time now for a rethink here in Washington, once again, the center of hostility towards one of America's nearest and smallest neighbors. First, though, with the help of English teacher turned tour guide, Nayade Primino, we can take a look at Cuba today in an era of challenges and changes. Hello, welcome to Havana, Cuba. My name is Nayade and I will be your tour guide for the day. Come with me. In the last 15 years, Cuba has been changed a lot because now we have the possibility to have a private uh, job, to have our own business. For example, here we have a souvenir shop and they sell sodas, water and uh, piña colada. And here we have an art gallery and over there we have a very new restaurant and very popular among the tourists. This, 20 years ago, wasn't here. Anytime you see this sign, it's a bed and breakfast. It's a private house that uh, Cuban uh, rent to tourists. What they make in one day, if you work for the state, you need one month to do it. I was working as a teacher, as a professional in a school. My employer was a state, and I earned like uh, 20, 25 dollars a month. One of my students offered me uh, a job to work for him, selling souvenirs, posters, and I used to work here till I start to work as a tour guide. But I really like to be a teacher, so for me it's really difficult trying to do another thing to have a better quality of life than to do the thing I like. We are looking at Hotel Manzana, remodeled the last year. This used to be uh, schools, uh, private houses for Cubans. This does not feel very Cuban. No, it's not Cuban. It's nothing Cuban. And the prices also are very, very expensive. Putting those stores like here in front of the Cubans that we can afford it, I don't think it's very polite to say in a way. You know, Havana is the touristic place and here in Colon neighborhood, you will find how Cubans live. Here we are in the bodega. Bodega is a small store in every neighborhood. You came here with your card and you get uh, different products like rice, beans, cooking oil, coffee, salt, sugar. The government provides you this every month. Uh, this helps a lot to the people that doesn't earn a lot of money. This one is another private restaurant, but as you could realize, it's not for tourists, it's for Cubans. Famous because pizzas are very, very good. The regular one is 12 uh, Cuban pesos, that is half of a dollar. The government salary is enough to pay the electricity or water or gas or the rent of the house that are very low. We don't pay for health care or our education. But, for example, it's not enough to, like, uh, going out with a friend or just having a pizza. My personal dream is uh, being working in a school, in a state school for children of nine years and earning maybe the right salary. Maybe not as much as to guide because I'm working for the state, but they give me the possibility to have a better quality of life. That's my heart. 
one thing that defined Cuba under the Castros was defiance of the United States. The neighbor that tried to overthrow the government and throttle the economy was seen as the enemy for so long. For the most part, the last six decades since Cuba's revolution have been shaped by a history of rivalry. This government, as promised, has maintained the closest surveillance of the Soviet military buildup on the island of Cuba. What's happening in Cuba is not a failure of the Cuban people, it's a failure of Fidel Castro and of communism. Sin crueles bloqueos que matan a hombres, mujeres y niños. Throughout this hemisphere, every nation except one has chosen democracy. Today, the United States of America is changing its relationship with the people of Cuba. We will begin to normalize relations between our two countries. Las medidas que recientemente anunció el presidente Obama, si bien son positivas, su alcance es mínimo. Effective immediately, I am canceling the last administration's completely one-sided deal with Cuba. So there's plenty to discuss with our guests. Here with me is James Williams, the president of Engage Cuba, which is a lobby group calling for an end to the U.S.'s trade embargo and the normalization of Cuba-U.S. relations. And also joining me is Ana Quintana, a senior policy analyst for Latin America at the conservative think tank here in Washington, D.C., the Heritage Foundation. Anna Quintana, U.S. foreign policy towards Cuba under President Trump is sounding like something from the old days uh, of the Cold War. Other countries are supporting the process of change on the island, and certainly there is a process of change going on. Becoming more involved with Cuba, the U.S. is going in the opposite direction. What does it have to gain by continuing the same failed U.S. policy of the last decades? I think President Trump stated that he wanted to cancel Obama's Cuba policy, right? Last June, that was his intent. And I think his administration has made some steps to kind of recalibrate the previous administration's policy. Um, hopefully, they're conducting, they're continuing to still conduct a review because I think we can have a debate as to whether U.S. Cuba policy has achieved its desired objectives. But, but what, Honestly, why cancel a policy that could have worked? Because clearly, uh -huh. the previous policy did not work. Uh -huh. The Castro regime stayed yeah. in place for the longest time. The system they built never collapsed, was never destroyed. Of course. No, and I agree with you. I do think we need to conduct a serious review of not just whether the embargo has worked, but whether the rest of our policy towards Cuba is achieving its desired outcomes. That does not necessarily mean that we need to revert back to what President Obama did, which is essentially granting Cuba a host of concessions without any sort of preconditions on change, which in fact has had negative consequences on U.S. national security. Is that how you see it, uh, James? Because I know your group played an instrumental role in driving the, the Obama administration toward the end of the second uh, term of President Obama toward no normalizing relations with Havana. Yeah, I mean, one thing I would respectfully disagree with Anna here is, you know, I didn't hear a solution out of this except for returning to what we've done. And that's, I think, the biggest challenge is this is sort of reverting back to what we know does not work. I don't think any of us can say with certainty in, you know, in policy making that, you know, what we do will 100% lead to different results. I think we can all agree that if we continue to do what we have been doing, it will not work. We've had 60 years of evidence now that that's the case. And so, you know, it's disappointing 
that we're returning back to something we know will not succeed. So what do you say to this argument? Well, I think right now we're in an incredibly challenging environment to, to have any sort of hope and faith that the Cuban government will unilaterally decide to change, particularly because of these health attacks against U.S. But, diplomats. But you don't know. Well, you mentioned health attacks, but there's no evidence to date, despite repeated uh, efforts by the uh -huh. FBI to go and investigate in Havana. There's no indication or evidence to suggest uh -huh. that the Cuban government was behind any attack. I respectfully disagree on that. So the U.S., the Cuban government is culpable for these attacks. Under the Vienna Convention of Diplomatic Relations, the Cuban government has to keep U.S. diplomats safe. But we don't, the same you, way you don't that, know how, you don't know that these were attacks. We the don't FBI know the itself methods. doesn't know that they're attacks. This is we the know issue. That, we don't know the We methods. know just for people uh -huh. who haven't followed the specifics. We know that Canadian and American diplomats yes. were said to have fallen ill due to some mysterious illness. No one knows how that happened. So it's not so an I'm surprised illness. that you that you seem to, to have no, some evidence. No, this is the issue. So what otherwise. exactly what's happened is over 20 U.S. over 20 U.S. diplomats and about two Canadian diplomats were targeted in health attacks. It's unknown as to the source, but what is known is that Cuba is a police state. It's known that whatever is happening to U.S. foreign diplomats on the island, the Cuban government is aware of. And under the Vienna Convention, under their diplomatic obligations, under their treaty-based obligations, they are obligated to protect our diplomats. So whether they were directly involved or whether they simply allowed it to happen, they are culpable to, to, to and liable for this. To many people, this will seem completely disingenuous uh, uh -huh. on the part of uh, segments of the U.S. Uh, uh, electorate uh -huh. and uh, the lobby group who wants to roll back the advance that the Obama administration made. How much uh, credibility do you see to these claims that uh, the Cuban government, in fact, tried to uh, undermine American diplomats in Havana? Yeah, I, I mean, I think that's fair to say, and I think this is what the FBI has said, who's leading the investigation, is they genuinely do not know. Um, they is, is, this, is this the Trump administration seizing on an opportunity yeah, to Yeah, I mean, in some ways it's a policy in search of a pretext. You know, but we also, you know, this happened, the announcement of these change of these incidents that occurred came out after the policy rollout in June. Mm -hmm. So this happened in August. You know, what we've seen since then is sort of a strangling of um, diplomatic relations by, you know, we now only have 10 American diplomats in Cuba at the time of the most significant change in 60 years. And you this know, is the we lowest level consular of, service is no, basically to zero. The lowest level of uh, U.S. Uh, diplomatic representation in the past uh, 40 years. This decision by the Trump administration, for whatever reason uh -huh. uh, it was, this decision to roll back the progress that Obama had made doesn't fit, doesn't gel with what the majority of the American public want to see happen. Uh, James, give us an idea of recent surveys that have shown the extent to which most Americans, and in fact even most Cubans, want to see a normalization of relations. Yeah, well, I, it's the challenge on this is that, you know, this is not uh, it's a, a political policy, not a, you know, a merit-based policy. And I think part of the challenge of that is, you know, definition of what your political calculus is. And I think, you know, we have seen sort of, you know, every survey that's come out over the last 10 years, but particularly the last five years, has shown you know, upwards of 80% of the American people support engagement. Um, you know, that includes Republicans, Cuban-Americans, business leaders, whoever, you name it. But it also shows, like, you know, just an unending sort of hypocrisy, which I think the American people understand, which is we deal with Saudi Arabia, we deal with China, we deal with Russia, we deal with Vietnam, you know, all these places, you know, where it's it's ridiculous to go in there and lecture, you know, Cuba on human rights singularly, where we have, you know, the president dancing at a men-only concert in Saudi Arabia, right? Um, and we're selling them $1.2 billion worth of weapons yet you can't even travel freely as yeah, well, an American citizen. And this is what just happened recently with uh, the sale of, as you say, 1.2, right. 1.3 billion dollars worth of weapons to Saudi Arabia. Mm -hmm. I mean, how do you look at this argument being made by so many that this is just sheer hypocrisy? Trump has vowed to maintain his distance from, quote, leaders who don't share U.S. values, but do the current leaders of, as uh, James just pointed out, Saudi Arabia, the Philippines, Egypt, really share the U.S.'s uh, core values? Well, the U.S. foreign policy is not a cookie-cutter policy. Our policy towards Cuba should not reflect and be mirrored in our policy towards Saudi Arabia. There's a greater national security interest at stake in the Middle East and in U.S.-Saudi cooperation. what is the national security interest in here Cuba, when it comes to Cuba? Our geographic proximity to Cuba, Cuba's relationship with U.S. adversaries. It's Cuba's command and control of what's happening in Venezuela. And the command and control... With who? They have relationships with the rest with of the North. world. I mean, and it is the U.S. that is ceded ground. Of course. To, to but does the countries. United States have a relationship with North Korea? Is the United States, un, uh, just like Cuba, have supporting North Korea's efforts to well, skirt U.S.? Well, that's the thing. As one. we should, North Korea is a nuclear-armed state. But 
but is the United States engaging in violating UN Security Council sanctions with the North Koreans? No, that was the Cuban government. And we also have to look again, Cuba's role in Venezuela. Yeah, I'm sorry, OAS Secretary General Almagro specifically said that Cuba has what's called a command and control army inside of that's, Venezuela. That's a lot of benchmarks, don't you think? That's a lot of shifting goalposts. I, I don't think I'm shift. No, there are no goalposts being shifted. You asked me to outline what are the U.S. No, national the US security interests. I mean, they uh -huh. wanted the end of the Castro regime. That is precisely what is happening, isn't it? Isn't that what the U.S. has always said? Well, in, in terms of hereditary, in terms of the hereditary name, right? We're now seeing have biology. have a generation of leadership We're taking biology over. Take isn't place. it a time mm -hmm. to show the Cuban people mm -hmm. that this relationship can be a forward-looking relationship, a positive relationship, a constructive one? Yeah, well, right now, I mean, this is a bankrupt foreign policy. I mean, it has... It's, it's, I, we can, you know, we can all have preferences, ideas, sort of in values. I think it's undeniable that what we've been doing for 60 years has been an abject failure. And so returning to that in any form is a mistake. But it's particularly a mistake now when Cuba is going through, you know, this incredibly important transition at a time of global uncertainty. And the United States should be leading, shaping the values of the future. You know, one of the things that we always talk about is societies that are fearful are the ones that tighten and repress. You know, it wasn't the United States who built the Berlin Wall. We didn't have a travel ban on the Soviet Union. We're not afraid to communicate ourselves. We're not afraid to be ambassadors of our own values. The idea, you know, it's repressive governments that are afraid of their own citizens. And so our view is we need to be shaping the future of Cuba by being involved, by being engaged, by being on the ground, by actually knowing what's going on. We don't have diplomatic officers that can tell us about what's happening on the country as it's going through that. That hurts our human rights agenda. That hurts our security agenda. That hurts our economic agenda. That is a serious mm. problem. Anna Quintano, for you, I mean, your final thoughts on this. You just heard what James said. Uh, disengagement, hostility isn't going to get the U.S. anywhere when it hasn't clearly for the past 60 years. I know you're a first-generation Cuban-American, mm. the daughter of Cuban refugees. This is all about the hardline constituency in Florida, is it not? No. And is the new generation not willing to look look forward, look ahead? Well, I think the Cuba's new generation should be willing to look forward, and I, I'm, I, I remain hopefully optimistic. But that this your leadership, are you, are you, are you well, ready this to look is, forward? Well, this is the issue. I, I, I'm definitely ready to look forward, and I would hope, again, Cuba's new leadership would look forward and allow the Cuban people uh, to have an opportunity to select its leadership. And I hope that that's the case. But in reality, that is not at all what the, what the newly appointed leader of Cuba has vowed to has vowed to maintain. And also, we should not look at biology as a simply as simple uh, Raúl Castro's now 80 some odd years and him stepping down. Uh, we shouldn't herald this as a transition. It's an illegitimate succession of power. Well, I'm afraid on this note we'll have to leave our discussion. Anna Quintano, James Williams, thank you both very much. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Well, for the next president, filling the shoes of the Castros will be no easy task. Widely tipped to take over is Raul Castro's deputy, first vice president, Miguel Diaz Canel. Here's a look at the man expected to become Cuba's new leader. Ese gobierno que estamos eligiendo va a ser un gobierno que se va a deber al pueblo. El pueblo va a participar en las decisiones que tome ese gobierno. deteniendo todo aquel proceso de restablecimiento de, de relaciones al producto de una administración que ha ofendido a Cuba. Well, people all across Cuba will be anxious to see what their new president will offer and if the change will make a difference to their daily lives. 
We met one young woman and her family to get their thoughts on life in Cuba. Young and old alike, they are all part of the Castro generation. My name is Lacey O'Farrell Nicholas. I have 27 years old. When I was very young, I started to study music. A los seis entro a un conservatorio de música hasta los 18 años. Eh, después ingresé, ingresé en la Universidad de las Artes a estudiar cine. Me graduó este año. Y ahora, bueno, la pintura también ha pasado a formar parte de mi mundo profesional, ¿no? Porque, bueno, tuve la oportunidad de poder exponer en galerías. Agradezco mucho el que aquí la educación sea gratis. Yo pude hacer una carrera como músico, pude hacer una carrera como cineasta gratis. Cuando termine la escuela, eh, me veo buscando exponer eh, en otros lugares, otros países, en otras tierras, donde pueda tener más posibilidades también incluso. Aquí lo puedo hacer, pero de yo decirte que puedes vivir plenamente de lo que haces sería engañarte. Pueden haber mejorías, pero en las tiendas, los, por ejemplo, los precios siguen igual. Los salarios siguen siendo los mismos. Y yo sigo sin poder acceder a ciertas cosas. O sea, ya soy una mujer, no soy una niña. Y aún me tiene que seguir manteniendo mi abuela y me tiene que seguir manteniendo mi mamá. Independientemente de, como digo, las carencias que vamos a tener, hay que decir, el plato de comida nos falta. No, 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 no nos vestimos de lujo, no usamos ropa de marca, pero nos vestimos. Mi mamá estuvo muy enferma eh, y no nos costó un centavo. Hay cosas que yo sé que el cubano no está dispuesto a perder. Cuando en aquella época que yo terminé mi comercio, yo nunca pude trabajar. Porque en mi pueblo, las negritas no trabajaban en oficina. Cuando tú fue la revolución, yo vine para acá, para la Habana. Y al venir para acá, yo enseguida que me presenté para trabajar en una oficina, me aceptaron. ¿Quién me iba a decir a mí que yo iba a trabajar por el Estado? Tengo que agradecer eso, no lo tengo que agradecer eso a la revolución. Y ahora vamos a querer saltar de ahí para el capitalismo. Eso no puede ser. Porque mucha gente, yo estoy vieja ya, no podía luchar contra eso, ni ir para la manigua. Pero hay mucha gente que está dispuesta a coger el machete. Lo que mi abuela entiende por oportunidades, para mí, o sea, yo eso no lo veo como oportunidades, yo lo veo como derechos. Hablo de otro tipo de oportunidad. Mi abuela, mi mamá y yo, obvio, ¿no? Somos muy diferentes. Es una cuestión también generacional. Mi mamá, y a veces yo le digo, pero mía, no sé cómo tú puedes vivir tan tranquila, o sea, como conformarte. Ella nunca ha visto esa sonrisa, yo le digo, pero no sé cómo tú puedes realmente, porque a mí lo que me dan ganas es de llorar o de matar a alguien. Yo soy muy, ¿cómo decirte?, muy transgresora, ¿no? Y muy defensora de mi manera de pensar, de lo que yo quiero. Y siempre dije que iba a luchar por eso. The thoughts of Leise Nicolás and her family in Havana. Still ahead on the program. We hear from the Cuban exiles in Florida's Little Havana who have a big say in the U.S.-Cuba relationship. There are some changes, but there are not the changes that all these people in here, Cuban Americans, are expecting. Welcome back. In the struggle between the governments here in Washington, D.C. and Havana, there is another vital center of power. Florida is home to the majority of Cubans and Cuban Americans in the United States. More than a million of them live there, in a state which can help decide the outcome of American elections. So presidents and candidates always listen very carefully to what they have to say. And for the most part, they're in a state of opposition to the Cuban government. It's been 50-something years, there hasn't been no change. How is there going to be a change right now? It's the same team, same people, unless there's a real change and then we believe it. Until now, there's no change. We've seen in history, there's always a promise of changes and everything still is the same. Um, I'm optimistic that one day something will actually change for the better of the country, but I don't think that because there's a new president now, 
just gonna be such a radical change. Um, he's just gonna be one of the other puppets. There are some changes, but they're not the changes that all these people in here, Cuban Americans, are expecting. Raul is leaving, but he's still there. Fidel passed away. And the other people, the originals from the revolution, you know, are now 81, 90, and maybe uh, 100 years. There should be a new generation. And the problem that Cuba has right now is that the Cuban generation today, the teenagers and the ones that have gone to school, that they have received a good education and stuff like that, are not happy and they come to the United States. I wish I had uh, the freedom to go back to Cuba under a different government without fearing being put in prison for my political views. Time is taking over. And uh, eventually, in a few years, because uh, it happened to all of us, uh, Raul Castro won't be around. And, uh, and hopefully, with that new generation, there is a greater chance that uh, a change will happen in Cuba. Here in Washington, too, campaigners are pushing for the U.S. to keep a hard line against Cuba's government. One of them is former U.S. government official, now lobbyist, Jose Cardenas. He has supported President Trump's decision to scale back relations with Havana. I asked him if it is now time to admit that America's tough treatment of Cuba has failed to achieve its aims. What the, what the Cuban government has in mind is not a transition to something better for the Cuban people, as in more freedoms. Because this gentleman, who ostensibly is going to be the face of the regime from now on, Diaz-Canel, is nothing but a, a Communist Party apparatchik. He will, he is merely a, a, a front for a continuation of this dictatorship. And I believe that now, more than ever, the United States ought to be uh, uh, denying resources to help this regime transfer power to a new uh, to really what but, is the same it's, situation. It's a little confusing though because that goes counter to what we are seeing now about to happen in Cuba which is this transfer of power to a non-Castro, to a non-revolution mm -hmm. figure, someone who was born after the Cuban revolution, a non-military figure, a, a younger generation. How well, much hope do you give to the Cuban people who you say you are there to help in I the think, long term? How much hope are you giving them by continuing this policy? I think that what is going on what is going on behind the scenes in this ostensible transfer of power to Diaz-Canel is really the first step in what Raul Castro hopes or intends to be a dynastic succession to his son, who is a colonel in the Ministry of the Interior, Alejandro Castro Espin. What Raul Castro envisions is a, a dynastic succession to his family. So why isn't that taking place if that's why? It's because uh, Cuba, even though you, we all understand that, that unity has been a, uh, a constant since the beginning of the revolution, but to this day, what you have in Cuba are, are Fidelistas and you have Raulistas. The Fidelistas are not sold on the fact that Raul Castro wants to transfer power to his son. So this is an interregnum. This is a short-term pause. Well, but we don't know. The fact of the matter, matter is Raul Castro said he was stepping down, and he is. But Cuba is a sovereign state, is it not? So shouldn't it decide for itself what kind of system of economic and political governance is best well, for the, itself the, the and for its own people? the fact of the matter is, is that for 60 years, the Cuban people have not had an opportunity to voice what they want for their country. This is a country that for six decades decades has been dominated by a military clique, uh, whether it's Fidel Castro or Raul Castro. These are the, this is the same generation and the even Cuban so, people. E even so, the Cuban people now have the chance to embark on a new journey with a new government, with a new leadership. But what is the U.S. doing to help in that vein? Because what you have done, what you have urged and what President Trump has done is undo 
the, the opening and the detente but, that Obama put in place, which led to the easing of restrictions on travel, on Americans going to Cuba but, and help, helping the economy grow. But regardless of Why what the this stop? regardless of what President Obama uh, instituted during his tenure, the Cuban government itself is already circumscribing the micro, the the activities of the micro enterprises. This occurred about a month ago, where uh, you know, regardless of what the United States was doing, was sending more tourists to Cuba. The, the, the government decided that they were going to close down more of the space for the microenterprises because they don't, but they that's not fear what happened. empowered you and, I, Cubans. you and I know that that is not what happened. If we that go back to over a year true. ago, the Trump administration seized on an incident, an, a mysterious incident that uh, allegedly took place in Havana, where a number of U.S. diplomats were said to have fallen ill because of some kind of quote unquote sonic attack. Uh, which the FBI itself says it has no evidence that it ever happened. And because of that, U.S. diplomats were withdrawn from Cuba and Cuban diplomats were expelled from the United States. Well, I happen to know some of the individuals who uh, suffered in Cuba, and then there's nothing alleged about what happened to them. And in fact, it's, it's tragic that their careers have been hurt this way. Something happened to them, and, and they were targeted. This was something that was deliberately targeted something happened to those dip diplomats in Havana but what happened for which Do you know for sure what happened because the FBI itself Look, has in a in a report that was recently uh, uh, put together and leaked to the media has right. come back and yeah, found that, that there was you no everything. evidence that tells of a you sonic. everything this is you your need own to know. investigators the FBI that tells you and, everything and they've undertaken you need to know about this thing was do you have the better, media do you have better evidence than the it FBI it was described does? in the media as an interim report by the FBI that was leaked to the media. I don't know what you know, on it wasn't earth just an interim that. Republican report Senator is supposed Jeff to Flake mean. Himself. I don't know what an interim let, report is. Let me just add is. to it then. Well, Republican Senator Jeff Flake, in a briefing to the Senate, says that he had no cause to doubt what the Cubans have said. Something happened to them. And it, it, doesn't, it justify, doesn't matter doesn't justify what it was. The but policy, because it doesn't justify to the, to, the policy because, that Trump... Because of the conventions, the diplomatic conventions, it is the responsibility of the host government to ensure the protection of foreign diplomats operating in their country. Cuba failed to do that. That was Jose Cardenas speaking to us earlier. Now, pressure from the Cuban-American lobby is one reason why the U.S. trade embargo is unlikely to end anytime soon. It's been a defining factor in Cuba's development, along with Cuba's commitment to a centrally planned communist system. James Champion has our five facts on Cuba's economy. The U.S. still does business with Cuba, despite the trade embargo. In 2017, America exported more than $283 million worth of goods to Cuba. But the embargo is still hurting. Cuba's government says it has cost them $126 billion since it began. The average Cuban salary is $25 a month. That would put most people below the international poverty line of $1.90 a day, although no official figures are published. But Cubans get quality free education and health care, Cuba has one of the world's highest literacy rates, and an average life expectancy better than many wealthier nations. The medical sector is one of Cuba's most successful exports. 37,000 Cuban medics are delivering services abroad in 77 different countries. They reportedly earn the government $8 billion per year. Record numbers of tourists are boosting Cuba's economy. There were 4.7 million in 2017, and the industry is a top source of income. Tourism earned Cuba $3 billion last year. Trade with Cuba's main ally has collapsed. Venezuela has long supplied Cuba with cheap oil in return for teachers, doctors and military advisors. That trade was worth $7.3 billion in 2014 but crashed to $2.2 billion in 2016 as Venezuela was hit by an economic crisis. And now Venezuela has been overtaken by China as Cuba's top trading partner. Well, the draw of American dollars continues to bring thousands of Cubans to the United States each year. One of those is 33-year-old Dairan Santamaria, a trainee engineer in Cuba 
Here in the US, he's a pastry cook by day and cab driver at night. He shared with us his exile story. I decided to, to come to the United States to have a better life. While I was a technical electrician in Cuba, and I was making $25 a month, while my sister was over here making thousands of dollars, so the comparison is huge. I wanted, to, I wanted that life for me. I wanted to live a better life. I've been in prison three times in Cuba, three nights every time, just not because I'm a criminal or anything, but just because I was trying to escape the country. I came to the United States as people. It was really dangerous. You're risking your life to come here through the ocean, and, uh, and you never know what's going to happen. We started going and going inside the ocean, and uh, the police in Cuba saw us leaving. Everybody was crying and everybody was like um, screaming things to them, like, please don't shoot, please don't shoot. We have children in here. Once we actually cross the line between the two countries, like United States and Cuba, they call it open ocean or something like that, they stopped following us. And then once I was in uh, United States water, I feel the freedom, I feel free. I saw so many pictures of the United States, but until you don't experience and until like, you don't get here and see everything, you don't know what is it like. I lost my dad in 2010. I really suffered so much because he died from a heart attack. And uh, when I asked Cuba for a humanitarian visa, they say, no, you're not welcome to Cuba because you skate. How you claim to be such a free country and you're so amazing with people and this and that, everybody's social, and everybody's equal, everybody's, you know, when, when you're doing this to people, they make millions out of millions of people working for them, literally. The people in Cuba are suffering and I are in need of the most basic things in life. They lock you out. They don't, they don't provide internet for you, so you don't learn about what's happening in the outside, the news, anything. I'm very thankful to be, to be an American today. Cuban migrant Dairon Santa Maria there. While continuing the tough line against Cuba has left America increasingly isolated on the international stage. The United Nations General Assembly holds a vote every year on scrapping the U.S. embargo. Last November, 191 countries favored ending it. The U.S. and Israel were the only nations who voted against. So plenty to talk about uh, here with our guests. Marguerite Jimenez is the director for Cuba at the Washington Office for Latin America. And Ted Picon is a senior fellow in the Latin America Initiative at the Brookings Institution here in Washington, D.C. Uh, Marguerite Jimenez, as we just saw, instead of isolating Cuba, both diplomatically and economically, the United States has managed somehow to completely isolate itself at the United Nations. And there's no shortage of people now stepping in to do business with Cuba, from the Russians to the Chinese to the Europeans. Does it make any economic, political sense for the U.S. to continue down this path? No, absolutely not. This is not an America first, either foreign policy or business policy. If anything, this is an America last business policy and foreign policy. So, so what is the solution? I mean, until when will this go on? How much, uh, how much uh, importance will the United States under President Trump attach to the cost the pro-embargo policy is having both regionally and globally? I would like to think that uh, there could be some positive changes on the horizon, but unfortunately, I think the administration has shown that uh, it isn't overly concerned with what, uh, with what other countries, particularly in Latin America, 
uh, think about its foreign policy towards Cuba. So I don't expect any dramatic positive changes. No uh, dramatic positive changes. Uh, Ted Picon, do you see the, the situation the same way? Because it seems like the goalposts keep shifting as well. If the proclamations of President Trump at the UN General Assembly last September were anything to go by, let me just quote him. He says that the embargo will continue until, quote, the corrupt destabilizing regime in Cuba makes fundamental reforms. Well, this has been U.S. policy for 60 years now, and it's codified by our Congress as a matter of law. So in fact, if the president wanted to move ahead, he would still be restricted in what he wanted to do, as President Obama was. But I would agree, I mean, it's not only is it America first, I think it's, it's, a, it's a Florida first policy. It's just all about domestic politics, and it makes no economic sense, but it does make political sense if one looks at it from the point of view of domestic politics. So, so is this all about domestic politics then, the resurgence of the pro-embargo Florida-based lobby? I, I would argue strongly that it is. The Miami community that's in favor of the embargo has kind of doubled down, supported uh, Trump, and they're very much, through Senator Rubio in particular, in, in his corner. But. As you said, there are many other countries that are stepping in to fill that void. And um, I think Cuba is very much trying to diversify its relations beyond just Venezuela. That's also a very important part it, of the it, equation. And it clearly is not able to rely anymore on the oil subsidies from Venezuela next door. But the Russians, the Chinese are stepping in. Are they filling the gap? I think not only the Russian and Chinese, but I think Cuba is very clear that it's not going to go back to a its kind of previous uh, relationship of dependence that it's had with other countries. So as Ted said, Cuba's really looking to diversify its trading partners and seeking to not have any one country be, uh, be responsible for too much of Cuba's trade profile. And it wants to be treated um, respect, respectfully, doesn't it? I mean, President Obama reset the relationship. He walked back the old US policy of regime change explicitly when he met Raul Castro uh, in 2016. What will the effect of this renewed hardline approach by Trump have on Cuba itself? And I know you were there just this past uh, December. Yeah, so what we know from talking to people on the ground and, and kind of what history has taught us is that when the U.S. is more hostile, Cuba essentially feels under, under siege and adopts this kind of circling the wagons mentality. So a policy of hostility from the United States makes it harder to enact reforms on the island and also gives, uh, gives people in the Cuban government kind of an excuse. It emboldens the hardliners. Absolutely, and to close political spaces on the island. So this is not a policy that is going to su actually support the Cuban people. And precisely that is what the United States claims to do, that it is actually keeping on this track of enforcing an embargo in order to, in a way, starve the, the government there, the Castro government, which of course is changing hands. But it is punitive, uh, it's punitive measures Very much that so. add I up mean, to collective punishment. You, in when, a way. when President Trump went to Miami last May, he made it very clear that this was a policy of regime change. It's a return, in a way, to the policy of regime change which President Obama tried to get us away from. So I think the reaction you get in Havana, of course, is, is as Marguerite described, this siege mentality. So it doesn't, it doesn't advance our U.S. goals, our stated goals of supporting the Cuban people. If the goal is to, for example, support the private sector in Cuba and allow it to grow, but then you're cutting off U.S. travelers to visit, you're making it more difficult to do business in the island, then you're not helping the private sector. And it does sound increasingly hypocritical and self-defeating, doesn't it, Marguerite Jimenez? I mean, you, you speak to a lot of people, and just by watching what has been going on all these years, in fact, these last few decades, does the U.S. treat any other country the way it has treated Cuba since the 1960s? We hear President Trump is now ready to shake the hand of Kim Jong-un, or at least to, you know, engage with North Korea, which... Uh, I suspect presents much more of a national security threat than Cuba does. He is ready to, uh, to embrace the leaders of countries that have egregious human rights records, Saudi Arabia and others. Why is Cuba the exception? I think Cuba has been you know, a thorn in the side of the United States for decades based on this kind of historical sense that Cuba should kind of belong to the United States and, uh, and the United States kind of feeling scorned by the Cuban revolution. And then as Ted mentioned, uh, the fact that this is a local, this is a local political issue in terms of the Im influence that Florida politics have had kind of on the national political scene in the United States. What do the neighbors think? I mean, you look at uh, Latin America as a whole. How do they feel about this ongoing situation? 
if we if we contrast what's going on now relative to when President Obama went down to the summit of the Americas and and took the opportunity to meet with Raul Castro, that was really welcomed in uh, in the Western Hemisphere as being a sign that the United States was no longer. Uh, kind of meddling in the affairs of other countries, but also no longer going to pursue this isolationist foreign policy towards Cuba. I think what we see now is uh, the United States is isolated in the hemisphere and a real lack of leadership in the hemisphere from the United States on Cuba, among many other issues. Well, what do you expect to see happen, if not here in the U.S., then in Havana itself under the new leadership? Uh, yeah, I think we're facing a situation that is unprecedented for the first time in decades. We'll have a Castro not as head of the country, but Raul Castro is staying on as head of the party. So I assume there'll be a lot more continuity than change. Uh, there is a generational change underway with a you know, 57 year old uh, party member likely to be elevated as president, but he's of the party and you know he's unlikely to do anything, I think, dramatic. That's despite the fact that Cuba really does need to tackle a number of pending economic and political reform issues. And both Raul and Fidel before him, in fact, uh, acknowledged this fact. Uh, Fidel, interestingly, uh, said to a visiting U.S. Uh, uh, journalist at one point uh, before the end of his tenure that he felt that the system, the economic system, was no longer providing what it was meant to do initially. And Raul himself, both publicly and privately, apparently has acknowledged that serious reforms have to take place. Yeah, and that is the big question. Will uh, the next leadership be able to tackle those changes, even though Raul has not been able to, to a point. I mean, he was able to generate and initiate a number of important reforms, but then they stalled out in but the how, last year or two. Well, why so, though? How important is the conservative voice among uh, the, the, uh, the revolutionaries within the Communist Party? How important is that voice still to this day? And how likely is it to pull back Diaz Canel, the presumptive next president, if he wants to go uh, further ahead with economic reform? I think there's no doubt that the conservative voice is important, but I think, I think Diaz-Canel faces such an imperative in terms of the economic challenges that the island faces. He's going to have to move forward. I think the question is the breadth and the pace of economic reforms. And even, even Raul was very clear about that. He was famous for saying, you know, the reforms would proceed uh, without pause, but without haste, yes. right? So this is, this is very clear that something needs to happen. I don't expect the hardliners to be able to completely stall reforms. What will the most uh, Cubans, do you think, both the old and new generation, want to see happen first, though, in terms of reforms? I think they fundamentally, there's a widespread consensus in Cuba that to protect the social contract that the revolution brought to them. So the economic and health care advances that the country is known for have been deteriorating of late. And so reinforcing and protecting that social contract, but also continuing to give the Cuban people a little more freedom in their ability to uh, live their lives uh, without the state intervening all the time. And, and that's the problem he faces, uh, the challenge of moving far, but not moving too far ahead too soon, I suppose. But he also doesn't want to alienate the reformers in the country and the new generation of Cubans who, who want to have a better life on the, on the island. Yeah, without question. He has a very tricky balancing act where he needs to generate consensus in a way that Raul Castro hasn't had to do because he, his legitimacy will be based almost entirely on performance and service delivery. And if he delivers on the economy precisely, what about U.S. relations, uh, U.S.-Cuban relations? How important will that be for most Cubans, do you think? Or does that take a, a secondary position? I think there's no doubt that the economy and improving the daily lives of Cubans is kind of first and foremost on everyone's agenda. I don't think anyone on the island, most people on the island don't want to see the, a rollback in the relations any further than it already has. But I think um, the priority for Miguel Diaz-Canel uh, has to be the economy. And I think, as you say, the most important thing for him now will be to assert his uh, legitimacy, his authority, and his independence, given the fact that Raul Castro will remain as head of the Communist Party for at least the next three years. I would be surprised if he does anything too bold uh, mm -hmm. to assert his independence. I think he's meant to be a leader who can bring the different factions together in a kind of consensual-based, technocratic almost uh, operation. Uh, and so I wouldn't expect anything too bold. Marguerite, just a couple of uh, final questions for you both. Do you see this as the end uh, of an era uh, or simply a change of the guard? How important is it as yeah, a I momentous think, occasion? I think there's no doubt this is something very different. I think um, regardless of whether or not Miguel Diaz-Canel comes from the party, he is also he's significantly younger. And this is, remember, the first time since 1952 
that Cuba will be ruled by a civilian as opposed to someone from the military. So I think those changes are significant and that this is a population where 70 to 80 percent of the population has only ever known a Castro as the head of the head of state. So I think the changes that are happening um, are are significant and we'll need to wait and see what ends up happening on the island. Of so course. a different leadership and new, new alliances, new dynamics? Well, I would say the military will still play a very important role in mm -hmm. Cuba going forward. Uh, I think as Cuba tries to diversify its relations, it knows already that it cannot expect a blank check from China or Russia. Yes, they can help here and there, uh, as Russia already has with some oil supplies. Now, if Russia were to dramatically increase its assistance to Cuba, uh, I think that would draw a quite negative reaction from the White House here. But and how much does the White House stand to lose by being absent for the most part? I think as long as its constituency that votes for them is happy, they will continue down this hardline approach. Ted Picon and Margarita Jimenez, thank you both very much. Indeed. Thanks thank for having you. us. So a new chapter is about to begin in Cuba. It's happening at a challenging time with the economy struggling and relations with the U.S. back on a rocky path. Stepping out of the Castro's shadow will be no easy task. Raul Castro will remain head of the Communist Party and the unofficial head of the military. The man expected to take over has promised more openness, but he could find himself the focus of demands for even bigger reforms of a political system created by the revolution, which now faces a generational shift and renewed tensions with the US. From me, Rida Fakhri, and all of the team here, thanks for watching.